Hello, world, too. This is Ms. Schnorr coming to you live from West Springfield High School. Well, probably not live because you're more than likely watching this tomorrow, but it sounded cooler than the alternatives of what I could say. All right, so just a little introduction here. If you don't know who I am, you're in Mr. Swain's class. Pretty good, but eh, not the best world, too, there is. But I'm Ms. Schnorr. I also teach world, too. And if you do, knew who, do know who I am, you're in the best class in the school. What can I say? All right, today we're going to be learning a little bit more about Ming and Qing China. In this unit, in our exploration unit, in our expansion unit, we have gone kind of all over the world. And really, we're starting with this whole idea of why are Europeans during this time period of 1500 to 1750 setting out and going exploring and colonizing other places around the world, right? We've talked about those motivations of the three Gs, right? Repeat after me. Gold, God, glory, right? Hopefully you should know that by, by heart now, right? And a lot of these Europeans, that gold aspect there is they wanted to control trade and specifically the spice trade. A lot of these spices are coming from China and a lot of other products as well. And China is going to be a main location um, that Europeans want to get a hold of and get a foot in so that they can control trade from China. So that's why we're going to be talking about this area of the world and connecting it back to our bigger theme of age of exploration. So let's get going. All right, so we're really talking during this time period, we're talking about two different dynasties. Okay, and if you remember back from to last year with World One, the different um, Chinese dynasties are basically kind of different ruling powers within China, right? So we're talking about the Ming Dynasty, which starts around the mid 1300s, is going to last until about the mid 1600s, right? The kind of wider background here, that is modern day China, and then the salmon color, we'll call it was um, what was Ming China and what was ruled by China under, under the Ming dynasty here. Okay. We're also going to be talking about Qing China, which for the most part, so this kind of purple outline here is the borders of modern day China. Um, it looks a lot similar to what we today call China, right? And this Qing dynasty is going to be the last dynasty in China. And after this point, we're going to start seeing, and this is going to be way down the line, um, we're going to start seeing first European imperialization in the area, as well as then China's going to have a communist revolution that we're going to talk about a little bit down the line. All right, so let's talk about China and Europe. Before this age of exploration, we have products going from China all the way to Europe, right? Remember those Silk Roads? So we already have that contact going. Um, however, if we remember, these products are changing hands all the way through the Silk Roads. And that's part of the reason that the Europeans want to get a direct route to China to get a hold of those products and kind of cut those middlemen out, right? Two of the main trade items that Europeans want from China are porcelain and tea. Porcelain you're probably familiar with. So it's this top picture here. The blue and white porcelain is very um, common and distinctive of Ming and Qing dynasty porcelain there, those kind of blue and white designs, right? China, or porcelain, you can think of as China, right? How many of you guys have, you know, Thanksgiving's coming up, mom's going to get out that, that fancy China, right, that's in the cabinet all year long except for on holidays? Generally, that's porcelain. Nicer dishes, nicer ceramics, Okay. And you can tell something is porcelain. Actually, if you were to break it, which, by the way, do not do that at home. Your mothers will kill me. Okay? But if you were to break porcelain, right, the edges of where it broke off would be pretty smooth, like glass almost. Okay? Whereas you were to um, break a, another dish or a, another ceramic dish, generally the edges would feel a little bit more grainy. So it's just a higher quality um, porcelain is a higher quality dish, essentially. Okay. The other big product is tea. When you think of tea, you probably think of England, right? 
And tea is going to become an extremely popular product within Europe and especially with England and the English Isles, right? And tea becomes a huge, huge commodity um, for those Europeans that can get their hands on that tea trade within China. And tea has an interesting history in China as well. There's actually a really kind of cool legend as to um, how tea came about in China. And it goes a little something like this. The emperor at the time was visiting distant villages. He had been going across China, kind of making a grand tour across China and, made, and visiting all these different towns and cities throughout China. And there's a small town in the middle of China that heard that the emperor was coming through. And they were super excited. You know, this is a big event for this town that doesn't really see a whole lot of, you know, anything going on really. So they're really excited and they decide we need to prepare for the emperor and make sure everything's ready to go for him. So one of the things that you would do during this time period was you would boil a huge big pot of water in preparation for guests. Because generally speaking, the water, you didn't want to drink it cold because if you drank it right out of the rivers or right out of the water sources, there would typically be, um, you could get sick, right? And the Chinese and really nobody at this time knew why you would get sick. They didn't know about germs. Okay, but they knew that if you heated up the water before you drank it, generally speaking, you wouldn't get sick, right? So they heated up this huge pot of water in preparation for the emperor and all of his kind of entourage that was going to follow him in case they wanted something to drink. And the story goes that the town is really excited about this. They have this water going. And the story goes that there's this huge wind that blows across the fields of this town. And this wind picks up all of these leaves, which happen to be tea leaves, and blows them in to the big pot of boiling water. Now the townspeople are starting to freak out. They're like, oh my gosh, like we've contaminated the, the emperor's water. Like we gotta get this going, we gotta fix this, right? And then all of a sudden over the hill, they see the emperor and his entourage coming along. And they go, oh my gosh, we don't have time for this. We gotta, we, we just, we got to get ready, right? So the emperor comes along. He stops in the village. And the village people are all just kind of waiting intensely like, oh, my gosh. What's going to happen? The emperor, he gets down from his, from, from his chariot. He goes over to the boiling pot of water, scoops himself a big old scoop of water, and takes a sip. Now the townspeople, they're all freaking out. They're like, oh my gosh, what's gonna happen? He's gonna, he's gonna taste the leaves, it's gonna be awful. And the story goes that the emperor looks at the townspeople. He goes, what have you done to this water? And the townspeople go, oh, we're so sorry. There's this big wind, we can't, you know, it's, it, it, we didn't mean to do it. We just didn't have time to clean it out. And he goes, no, 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 no. This tastes so good. Tell me what you did. I need all of those leaves, all of that tea gathered up before I leave so I can continue to drink this recipe, right? So that's the legend as to how tea became popular within China, became a um, product there. Europeans interact with the Chinese. They taste tea. They love it. Start importing it back to Europe and especially the English, and it becomes this huge, huge commodity for the Europeans. That's um, going to be really huge within Europe today, even. Okay. However, on the flip side, the Chinese didn't really want anything that the Europeans were willing to trade, okay, or that the Europeans really even had, right? So although the Europeans want these Chinese products, the Chinese don't really care for any European products. Every once in a while, they would, you know, trade for like clocks or like glasses or something like that. Um, but for the most part, they didn't want European-made things. They thought it was cheap. They thought it was less than their things. And so the Europeans ended up having to spend a lot of actual money, like gold and silver, to buy products from China. And that's going to cause a problem later on. Okay? The Chinese really considered their culture superior. They wanted to preserve it, and they didn't want those foreign influences of the Europeans coming in and ruining it. So the Chinese government during this time period is going to very heavily restrict foreign trade and influence. 
How they're going to do this is they are going to restrict where the Europeans can even go. So within Europe, there are two cities, or sorry, within China, there are two cities that Europeans can go and trade, right? And that's Macau and Wangzhou. Wangzhou is also called Canton, um, so you might see that either way. The Portuguese were the first to China, right? And they get the city of Macau, and they get to trade in that port city there. They have to stay in those enclaves. That's a good word for you there. They have to stay in those trading enclaves. They can't go out into China. They can't go outside of that city. They can't even really even go out of that section of the city that's meant for European traders. Again, all in this effort to preserve Chinese culture. Okay? Same thing in Wangzhou, but that's for everyone else other than the Portuguese. Okay? And only a few months out of the year as well. It's not like they can trade all year long. Again, the government very, very heavily restricts trade and influence of the Europeans here. Nice little picture of a uh, Wing Zhao here. All these different international flags. Trading city. Now, the British start gaining a lot of influence and a lot of um, control of this trade with China. And they want more of it. That's going to lead us to our next situation here, in this next encounter. This is a pretty famous encounter here between Lord McCartney, who is going to represent the King of England, and Emperor Qing Long, who was the Qing Emperor at the time. Okay. George III, he's the King of England. By the way, those of you who are Hamilton fans, yes, that is George III, that king. All right. <laughs> so George III sends Lord McCartney kind of as an ambassador to China. And the whole idea is Lord McCartney wants to go to China, and he is trying to negotiate with the Chinese emperor to open up more trade with China, let um, the English merchants go into other cities throughout China, right, and open up trade relations. That's the situation right here. So Emperor, Mac so emperor King Long, he decides that he is going to meet with McCartney, right? However... There are procedures that you must take if you are meeting an emperor. Okay. And McCartney, before he goes to the emperor, he meets with um, the emperor's people who really who go through and explain the procedures that it takes to go and meet the emperor. And for the most part, McCartney and his men agree to most of the, um, the things that they need to do. However, they refuse one very important thing. McCartney refused to perform a kowtow to Emperor King Long. And this is going to result in a huge, huge disrespect to the emperor. Okay? So the kowtow is literally like this ritualistic bow where you're literally getting down on your hands and knees on the floor, right? And you're touching your, your forehead to the floor there. And you're really, it symbolizes submission to the emperor. And this is a big deal. McCartney says, I cannot do that. Do you realize I am a representative of King George III of England? If I do that, it's like the King of England is bowing down to the Emperor of China. We can't have that. So, so McCartney just completely refuses to do the kowtow. All the people that are, you know, the Emperor's advisors are like, no, like, this is, you have to do this. If you have any chance of even talking with him, you have to do the kowtow. He's like, no, we're not going to do that. If I do that, that's like the King of England bowing down. We can't have that. Pieces to do it. So the Emperor and McCartney meet. And as you could probably have predicted, the meeting does not go well. McCartney refuses to kowtow. Emperor Queen Long is an extremely insulted and essentially just throws him out. Okay. The Emperor expects that the English and all traders with China. They're expected to follow the traditional tribute procedures, right? Whereas the Europeans, specifically McCartney and his entourage, they are expecting more foreign relations that are conducted in Europe, more kind of diplomatic things. So we really have a kind of a clash of cultures here and miscommunication going on 
um, with this meeting between Lauren McCartney and Emperor King Long. And it's going to 